wanted to take a minute and introduce our group of graduate students that will be presenting this morning and tell you a little bit about what I've asked them to do so that you know what their expectations have been. Um, just to give you a little context, um, this group of wonderful graduate students met all day Monday and one of the things they did was they had to prepare a five minute presentation on how their field or how they in their own work uses sustainability. And so the idea is that they've taken that presentation and they've modified it for today. So they'll do another five minute presentation, but modified from Mondays and based on something that they've learned or <laughs> some things that they've learned over the process of these last few days. So also just so that you know, we all went into Monday with the spirit of experimentation. Um, that we, um, I told them that I wanted them to try and be flexible in their thinking and go into it with an open mind, so I'm just going to ask the same thing of our audience here today, that that five minute presentation that you're about to see from each student could be probably anything. This <laughs> so um, some of the students have PowerPoint presentations. Not everyone does, and as far as I've told them, that is just okay. So I don't honestly know what we're going to get this morning, and I think that's great. Um, so uh, with no further ado then, uh, we will start with Ashley Colby, who is a doctoral student at Washington State University in sociology. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk quickly because I want to say a lot in five minutes. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk today about inclusive sustainability. This is the same topic I spoke on before, but I've modified it mostly due to conversations, extracurricular conversations with the other graduate students. Um, so something that I sort of noticed wasn't really happening in this conference was this acknowledgement that we're in a in a, a era of crisis or potential crisis, depending on who you are and how you define what crisis is, but multiple overlapping crises. This is one potential um, visualization of that. Look at look at the age that we're in. It's different, right? It's There's something going on there, and we need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge that there's sort of potential for multiple overlapping crises, economic, you know, social, political, environmental. Um, so I want to say that first, just it's sort of the elephant in the room. And so I want to say that I know that mostly everybody here already knows that, but just saying it as a premise is, I think, important for solutions. Um, and then I want to kind of put forward this idea of dual process, which is which was a it's a thought, um, a theory put forward by Morris Berman, American cultural historian. And basically, the theory is as some civilization collapses, um, other alternatives emerge. And so I, here I have a picture of Ro the Roman Forum in the height of the empire, and then the Roman Forum. Um, sort of with cows grazing on it um, a few centuries later. Um, so the idea here is sort of like, you know, we're, we are are a civilization, and if you might want to call us as collapsing or in crisis, well, when things are in crisis and sort of alternatives emerge sort of naturally, according to this theory. Um, so then I want to bring in sustainability. And for me, sustainability is sort of part of this process, this dual process, and in which, you know, sort of, People are understanding and coming to grips with these different kinds of crisis, um, trying to come up with meaning for this crisis. And then um, this sort of leads to a sort of paradoxical way in which people can deal with crisis um, and find ways to be resilient in the face of it. So I'll explain what I mean by paradox. Um, so I'm going to give you the example of Marty. This is Marty. That's a pseudonym. I asked Marty if I could show his picture with his wife um, today, and he said yes. Marty is a rural flower farmer, industrial flower farmer in Illinois, and um, I interviewed him as part of my dissertation, and Marty really hates environmentalists or environmentalism. He really does, he feels like it's elite interests. He feels like it doesn't represent him. He doesn't believe in climate science. Um, but at the same time, Marty produces food for his own consumption, and uh, he fishes and hunts and um, makes beer and wine and has vegetable gardens and all sorts of stuff. Um, and when he does that, he's deeply conservation minded and he does all sorts of behaviors that are deeply ecologically embedded. I mean, he cares deeply about the environment that produces food for him. Um, so this is a paradoxical person, right? In the concept of sustainability, we sort of deal with um, somebody who, uh, somebody like Marty is usually off the stage for talking about sustainability. So, so accepting that there might be some paradox in how sustainability plays out within individuals, processes, organizations, um, might be helpful to us. And I think the result of that, and this is my last slide, 
um, allows for a more inclusive conception of sustainability because I think from 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 my research, um, nearly everybody has some perception of crisis and some sense that there's something going wrong. Um, so I think you can harness that to to sort of understand this inclusive nature of um, we're in this boat together. This and there's there's lots of sort of mapping common ground. I think um, that's that's potential if we can sort of let our barriers and our identities fade away and sort of talk about the, the nuts and bolts. Um, okay, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, my name is Esther Zifori. I'm a PhD student at uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology I'm in the Urban System Program. Oh no, I opened the wrong one. Where are we? Um, and I will be talking about sustainability in my field of research, which is sustainability and mobility, or how I frame my uh, potential dissertation as sustainability and transition toward a post-automobile urban environment. Um, so what does that mean? Oh, sorry, this chair is very odd. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, sustainable transition to uh, urban mobility is basically the idea to transition away from privately owned automobile systems. Um, and how? And my question here, and what I'll speak about in this next four and a half minutes, is how sustainability is defined in that, the context of mobility, and how I, how I personally fragment um, the larger concept of sustainability into my own research for measurable uh, categories. So mobility basically equals accessibility. And accessibility is the way that we both physically and not physically um, access a variety of very fundamental uh, aspects of health service, education, food, clean water, information. Um, and just to put it out there, um, accessibility or movement has already become a fundamental human right, both by the UN Declaration on Universal Rights and the European uh, Union Constitution. So sustainable mobility, as I try and work through it, is a process of balancing the, the, the three different elements of sustainability, social equity, environmental protection, and economic development, a continuous feedback loop uh, between all these three elements. So what does that actually mean as a practical effort of bal balancing these three parameters within uh, sustainable mobility? So here's just a few ideas of uh, how that kind of endless sorry, cycle of repetition might be able um, to work out. Um, these are the 10 categories that I personally in my research use to uh, kind of quantify sustainability, uh, sustainable mobility in a measurable format. And this is how all of these different elements continue to affect each other, um, again, in this endless loop of a feedback loop of one thing affecting the other. Um, and what I really took from this conference was this whole discussion we had about data and information and citizen participation. And in my own research, I have a lot of access to information and data about how different things are being used, uh, levels of pollution. Um, I, can, I can calculate the square footage of how much roadway is in a city. I have these tools today, but what I don't have and what I realized through this that I've been thinking constantly and finally was able to put into words um, is that I need to look at what people actually want. What do they need to have accessibility? What are their priorities to access? What can't they access? And how was this transition from a private car to something else um, will still answer those priorities? Because my priorities might not necessarily be the same priorities of all the people in the urban environments in which I'm interested in looking at. And I just wanted to show you this uh, amazing cartoon um, that you don't realize sometimes how much of the urban fabric has been taken away from people. Thank you.
Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to thank for giving me the opportunity to be here in this important meeting. I, my name is Joel Fernandez, and uh, I am a graduate student at Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. And in this opportunity, uh, I will present the relevance of, uh, of the social sustainability in the field of civil engineering. From the perspective of the civil engineering, uh, transcendental challenges uh, contribute to achievement a sustainable uh, development. In recent years, uh, the role of the civil engineering goes beyond uh, focusing on such as in, on the five fields, such as construction, uh, structural design, uh, environmental uh, man management resources, the need to develop a solution with a comprehensive approach arises and, bar and varies according to the to the to the place in which we live this uh, this needs has the purpose of promoting of social sustainability uh, focused on four social pillars such as equality awareness uh, for sustainability participation and social cohesion we, as a civil engineer, uh, have the task to generating socially sustainable communities uh, we, uh, where are the uh, well-beings and access to the basic necessities is guaranteed. Uh, for instance, in the presence of the extreme climatic conditions, such as earthquakes or uh, El Nino events, uh, which are recurrent in my country, uh, we must provide the essential tools uh, so that such uh, well-being and access to the basic necessities is not compromised. Uh, based on this, uh, I am currently focusing uh, in the study of erosion processes uh, and how they severely impact in the communities undergoing extreme climatic conditions such as a Niño solar oscillation. My research seeks to identify areas with high potential for water erosion and to develop uh, tools in land use planning uh, to can contribute to improve the social sustainability of the communities. In short, uh, one of the many things that I learned during this important event uh, was that if we don't work in an interdisciplinary way, the path to social sustainability will be difficult. Uh, we need to find better ways of communications between our disciplines and at the same time, uh, make the communities feel part of our initiative. I have understood that this is the best, the best way to achieve social sustainability. Uh, uh, again, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and um, thanks so much. All right, so uh, good morning. It's very glad to have this discussion with everyone here today. <clears throat> My name is Pen He and I'm a PhD student from Department of Geographical Science at uh, University of Maryland. And I would like to narrow down a little the focus of sustainability and project it into a specific uh, field, which is the food system. So my topic today will be approaching dietary sustainability. So the food system has been recognized as a major contributor to multiple environmental issues. It accounts for 13% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. It consumes 70% of the surface and groundwater, and that is connected to the, the contamination issues because of the fertilizer and the pesticide use. And it also occupies 40% of the land surface which result in deforestation issues and so on. And this impact has become more and more critical in recent years, not only because of the, uh, the global population increase, but also the dietary change happening everywhere in which people are now consuming more and more animal products such as meat. But that's not the whole story if we look at the other side of the coin, which is the malnutrition issues spreading all over the world. So one third of the global population are now suffering from malnutrition issues of different forms. So there are undernourishment um, problems, uh, which meaning that people do not have enough calories taking to support their daily life. And there's 
obesity and overweight, and there's hidden hunger issue, which means that people do not have enough or adequate intakes um, of, of minerals and vitamins. So this, all these problems leave us to wonder if there's any way that if we can find an answer for all these questions, if we can change the way that we consume our food, and that leads to the concept of sustainable diet. So according to the definition of FAO, a sustainable diet will result in low environmental impact while ensuring the the nutritional quality of the daily life and also this food safety. And beyond those two core parts of this concept, there are also other dimensions. Um, for example, a sustainable diet should respect the local culture and it should be accessible uh, for everyone. So that is related to the food deserts, uh, desert problem. And also it should be economically fair and affordable, um, whether it's for rich or the poor. So given that concept, this made us to think about whether there should be, um, should be some literature linking these things together. But unfortunately, if we're probing to the, uh, the current literature, they are, most of them just look at one or two dimension of this concept. So this calls for a development of a, a research agenda that can combine things together and that calls for integrated perspective. And basically it can be divided into like three parts or three steps. And the first is to, to define more clearly what should be a system of diet, what should be um, included in this concept. For example, if we want to minimize the environmental impact, which kind of environmental impact should be considered, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions or water consumption, et cetera. And then if we want it to ensure the nutritional quality, what standards should we use? Should it be food-based or nutri nutrition-based or um, something else? And how can we address this economically affordability and the fairness? Uh, is there any like qualitative or quantitative standards for that and also for the culture accept, uh, accept, accessibility? And once we develop those bunch of standards, we can look at how far away from that dietary sustainability by evaluating um, the performance and the impact of our current diet. And there is like a social uh, dimension of this problem because the diet is so diverse all over the world from the rich to the poor, from urban to rural area, and from like from uh, from China to the US in different countries. So that leads us to think whether like some diet would be in low environmental impact, but would that really support our daily life? Would that give us like healthy diet? And uh, with that considered, the next step is to think about like the potential usable um, policy tools that can motivate us uh, towards a more uh, more sustainable dietary patterns and uh, change our consumption behavior. And uh, for that, we can think of like the way that we build our um, our communities and whether that lead to a good uh, food environment. Like not only uh, not only in a, a commu community do we have like fast food restaurant, but we also have like Whole Foods or like a market where we can purchase healthy and fresh food. And also we can think of like the instructions in dietary guidelines or even some like price tools, and uh, uh, for which we can like both lower the environmental impact and uh, give us like uh, food that that we want to enjoy the healthy life. So that would be my presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Situ uh, Akibode uh, from Michigan State University. Well, let me put together my PowerPoint here. Sure. 
Okay. So is economic agency open to um, empirical assessment? But I just want to start first and talking about uh, uh, something that we call opportunity. If opportunity is not given to you, you may not be able to do a lot of stuff. For example, I came here today to that meeting, and not today, this week to this meeting here, because of a great opportunity that has been given to me. And uh, I shouldn't be, I would be able to do some networking, some learning, if I didn't have that opportunity. So in the development world, there are a lot of discussions regarding what make people really poor. So usually we go, we hand out benefits to them without knowing exactly how those benefits fit into their real needs. So Sen, Amatya Sen, who is a Nobel Prize, Nobel laureate, very influential, brought this aspect of um, capability approach. The capability approach is interesting in looking at people's capability. What are they really capable of doing? Not what they have in their environment. Okay, so it's more of what people are capable, have in reality as ability to do. Then you give them, you create that opportunity to them to to, to own that capability and to work on it. So this uh, same capability approach here has been widely used in poverty, education, hunger, gender, health, even housing, because I'm in urban and regional planning, I am in urban and regional planning program. So the SDI, which is uh, a United Nations uh, major publication, actually use this capability approach to be to for the design. So what can we just say here? I want to go quickly again through that. So you have uh, with the same capability, you have this entertainment. Entertainment is whatever you have in your environment, okay? Whether good or bad, you have the right to eat or you may be impacted negatively by it. And then the capability, yes, I'm happy now that they give me something real that I can use for my environment. Or I have some strength that I can use. I'm happy I can use it. Now, in this set of capabilities, actually, I choose one of them. You have a lot of set possibilities, but you choose if you want to live, like, for, like, like here, when I came here, I say, okay. I'm not going to do everything in Charlotte, even if I have the capability to go wherever, here, the night. I say, okay, this, this was given to me. That's the best for me, and I choose it. So that's the functioning that I usually finally, I finally choose. So the agency is how you use that entertainment and capability to create your own functionings. Now, economic agencies is how you behave like economic agent and putting together entitlement, capability, and functioning. Now this is like egg. It happened in a kind of egg system and it's kind of go around. And but what's the problem? What I, what, when I come to my title is how can we help people in the business world, for example, assess this uh, capability, because it's very hard for them to relate to entertainment and capability, those kind of concepts. So I go back, that's the, I go back to this SWOT analysis. The SWOT analysis is very well known, opportunity, threat, strength, and weakness. So that's a business and organizational concept. So with this approach, what we have is once you have some opportunity and strengths in your area, you have strategy to use. For example, here, opportunity and strength strategy, you use the strength to take advantage of your opportunity. If you have threats in your environment, but you have strengths in, as in yourself, 
what do you do? You use your strength to avoid the threat. So I adapt that sort of analysis to the same capability approach, which is uh, here. I may want to use this. So the same capability approach actually use entertainment and capability. So I put I add to the negative side of capabilities and capability. The negative side of entertainment is disentertainment. And when you go back to the sword that I really showed, entertainment are opportunities, disentertainment are threats, and capability are weaknesses, and capability are strengths. So from that same strategic analysis, you have whatever you can do regarding those situations. And what you do here are actually your agency. Okay, then when you behave like economic agent, you choose to make economic decision, it becomes uh, your economic agency. So this tool is to bring together several disciplines to understand each other when they deal with how to create better situation for people, for cities, or for countries. Thank you. Uh, well, my name is Maria Vivanco. I'm a PhD student in rural sociology at Penn State University. And as a rural sociology, I will, sociologist, I would like to explain a bit how my discipline works. Uh, basically, it's based in agricultural practices, but it's more than that. I'm talking about the class, classic uh, rural sociology. So we talk actually about food systems and what is the logic behind that. In a post-industrial area, there are a conflict in the center of the societies, and it's not only about access to resources, it's also about the access to information. Regarding agriculture, information about how to improve the genetics of seeds, for example, about certification, because we know that not all the peasants, the farmers, the producers have the same skills, training, to, or the money to afford this kind of certifications, and those are, for example, uh, the issues that rural sociology are interested. I'm going to put you an example in, to, in order to talk more about sustainability. I'm here in the U.S. like for one year, um, and I remember the first time that I went to a grocery store and I saw asparagus from Peru. I kind of have like, mixed feelings because in a certain way it's a certain proud because you know that Peruvian people produce that. but. On the other hand, in order to have like fresh asparagus, there are a lot of conflicts behind. Asparagus is produced in the Valley of Ica, where there is a lack or the scarcity of water. So many producers don't have access to water, and some of them have the chance to produce this fresh uh, asparagus. So there is this w digital water that is translated produced from Peru, but is now here in the U.S. in order to have this wonderful product. I'm not saying that everything is bad, but it's sometimes when we are going to consume something, we should understand this at the same time. So sustainability, and this is what I have learned during these days, have different dimensions. So we should start by talking about individuals. Does all the individuals have, do all the individuals have the chance to or the freedom to decide what they want to eat, what they want to do every day? Do they have the skills or the information in order to make like a good decision? And just as we were talking about the smart cities, so uh, I was thinking, what is the assumption that we have about these individuals? Sometimes I have the feeling that we are talking more about consumers rather than citizens, and citizens are not consumers. <laughs> uh, also, the idea about communities. Communities is more than people that is together. They have something in common. They have a purpose. They have differences too, but there is something that makes them be together. And what do we want to sustain as communities is a question that we should make to ourselves. If it's the environment, if it's the people at the same time. And if we want, for example, to uh, develop apps to know how is the city improving, we should develop also a culture behind that in order that the people can understand the, the importance of the objective of this app. 
we should talk also about countries because not all the countries are in the same position. In sociology, we talk about the dependency theory. Uh, we know that some countries, they cannot change the rules and they just have to accept their position in the global economy. And finally, uh, this is not only, sustainability is not only an interaction between the individuals that we are here right now. It's also the interaction with future generations that cannot say they they cannot talk for themselves. So we should find a way to think that problems that are right now, they're not going to be the problems that are going to appear tomorrow. So it's sustainability is also this constant thinking of what is happening now, but what is going to happen in the future. And what is the position of all the individuals in order to participate in this process of thinking or defining what is sustainability at the end? Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I want to, I want to um, focus on. My question focuses on the the word crisis. Okay. And I'm wondering if you have a particular attachment to crisis. No. Because I think that that, because uh, there are all sorts of ways to describe what I I thought you were describing, right? There's contradictions, there's transitions, and crisis evokes this, you know, almost like an, a sense of emergency, therefore we need to all listen to one oh, authority, right. and, you know, don't worry about anything, this is a crisis, you know, concede all I of see. your, all of your, everything. Right? Yeah, right. Um, so the language of crisis tends to erase any kind of- Agency, uh, or, or, or like time to let things sort of develop or slowly or it points us in the direction of one solution right um i don't think so though i mean okay but i i don't know but i can see that i can see what the point you're trying to make i'm not really wedded to that term right. i'm just trying to impart some sort of idea about um urgency sure. and sort of like you know i think we're all here because of this sense of urgency and so um, I just want to make sure we're not just, and, and incremental solutions are okay too, but mm -hmm. as long as we're not just sort of, my, my, my main critique is sort of maybe using the same tools that made the situation in the first place. Sure. Because then yeah. if you think of it as a more extreme thing than, than something that can be solved by just tweaking these tools that we already have, right. then I think you open up more sort of space for revolutionary thinking and I think more diverse sort of forms of thinking. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, I do. Um, I, but I don't know. Maybe you can suggest a better term that, than crisis that helps to like, get across that urgency, but without saying, like, you don't have a choice. Grab all your stuff. Let's go. Like, this is a crisis. Well, so yeah, crisis to me points into the direction of, well, we need geoengineering right now. Right. We just need, we need, right, we need to immediately stop what we're doing, right. um, concede to the best technological solution, and hope for the best. Like shock doctrine um, type stuff. Sure. Um, so I'm wondering. I I mean I like transition, but um, but you have to. But I think that, that's to me what sustainability works really well to do is that it highlights all these contradictions and that we need to uh, begin broadening our perspective. Right. In the context of these major global changes. Yep. So that okay. Was, that was cool. Comment. Thank you. I encourage you guys to keep that conversation <laughs> going. So the last thing I would like to do. Um, oh, sorry. Did you have a question? Well, I I wanted um, I don't know your name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Penn. Okay. I'm Deborah Franklin, and everything was wonderful that I heard. Mm -hmm. But uh, especially for Penn, uh, you had said uh, made a comment about people not taking in uh, calories to do their work. Could you repeat what you said about that? Because I um, I like the way you put that. The under nourishment or right. If you you had said something made a statement about calories not getting enough calories mm -hmm. to do their work so mm -hmm. I don't know if you just oh well, that's like in the in the South Africa country so mm -hmm. then people do not have enough food to eat so they do not have like uh, in most of the like dietary guidelines uh, mm -hmm. they said that people should take two thousand kilocalories for right per day to like support their daily life but in these countries most of not most of some of them do not have that uh enough intake up to like 2000 uh, uh 2000 kilocalories yeah 
you know, sometimes you hear that, but you don't really hear it. And so the way you said it, 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 it just affected me because, you know, people are counting calories in the restaurants here. They have to put the calories in Bob. And usually you think about getting too many calories, but... Yeah, that varies a lot across countries. Right. Yeah, and FAO has the statistics and if you're interested, you can like scan their website to to see like how 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 many calories uh, people are uh, eating for per day in different countries. I will. Thank you. Great, and I do want to encourage you to continue these conversations in the rest of the day. Uh, Jen Monroe has a quick comment before we continue. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, so we've been talking about incorporating students in a really substantial way since the beginning of this grant, and this is the first time we've done it in this way, and I, so I thought I'd just make a quick comment about um, my sense of what happened as a result, and that is that um, I'm personally heartened by the time I've been able to spend with these wonderful students and to do this exercise. I think it's been a really productive one for me, I think for all of you as well. Um, and listening to your talking, uh, to your presentations just now, I was thinking that um, it's easy when we're in academia or practitioners, we're, we're drawing on the experts, um, but it's what you were presenting and the way you were presenting it, how you evolved over the course of the day and how you articulated that, I think is a good reminder that um, part of being an expert is also being open to evolving in your thinking. And so having such a substantial graduate student presence is a good reminder of that. And that, um, you know, we're all here doing this work already, but you're going to be doing this work in the future, you are the next generation, and so it's it's been especially exciting for me to see that you all approach these questions with what I think are um, an excellent way to model a kind of expertise in evolving, um, and that is that you're approaching these questions with both curiosity and compassion. And so I would just encourage you and all of us to remember that as we're thinking about sustainability. That seems to be at the heart of what we want to do living with other humans on this planet. So, yeah. Great, thank you. And I do want to give a big thank you to Jen for um, helping us, for organizing the workshop on Monday and for coordinating with the poster session and the, the speaker series. So thank you, Jen. Now, I would like to quickly announce before I move to the next panel, the winner of our student poster prize. Um, we had a hard decision in terms of looking at all the different posters and all of the different information, and it was really quite difficult, but we've made a decision. Um, those of us who have been, um, so Brett and Robbie and I talked about the different posters and the different kinds of things that were presented. And I would like to, at this time, announce the winner and have them come up to um, receive their certificate, which of course comes with paperwork, but we'll, we'll handle that in a minute too. Um, so I'd like to announce that the winner of this year's poster presentation and the $500 prize um, provided by Idea Center here on campus is Maria Vivanco. Maria, could you come up? So Maria's poster was on the use or appropriation professional women's perception about an ICT strategy within a child care program in rural Peru, and we just felt it was a very strong poster, and we really loved being able to see your work. So congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I'm so glad you could come. So again, thanks to Idea Center for providing the money for that. And we're going to move on to our cross-site panel.